In this video, I'm going to be upgrading this first generation 2006 Apple MacBook Pro from its original 32-bit Core Duo CPU to a 64-bit Core 2 Duo CPU. Now, you might look at this and think that this is a very old machine, which of course it is, and that this upgrade in this day and age is probably not even worth the effort to do. And while that's probably correct, because of course you can just go out and buy a cheap, you know, late 2006 Core 2 Duo model MacBook Pro 17 inch, just like this one, uh, with the Core 2 Duo of course already installed, um, this is an upgrade I've wanted to do for a very long time, and in fact have attempted to do in the past, uh, but was never successful. Now the reason I was never successful, at least from what I think, is because when I did attempt to do this, uh, this was many, many, many years ago, uh, before I even had uh, most of the equipment I currently do, and I was using a very uh, poor quality hot air station, uh, pretty much no preheater at all, and I think the issues I was having was simply due uh, to poor soldering. So now that I've gotten the opportunity to try this upgrade again uh, with this machine that someone has sent in to me uh, specifically for me to perform this upgrade on, um, I want to see if I can successfully perform this upgrade uh, on this system at long last. Now, this upgrade has been done already by other people um, on the A1181 MacBook, the original Core Duo uh, MacBook, uh, but I don't think I've ever seen it done um, on the Core Duo MacBook Pro, either 15-inch or 17-inch model. So, in order to achieve this upgrade, of course, uh, the base of it is we need to get a Core Duo two duo CPU that's compatible with this chipset um, installed, uh, soldered onto uh, this machine's logic board. And in theory, it should just work. So what I've got here in front of me is a donor board to pull the CPU from. And this is a 15 inch Core 2 Duo MacBook Pro model uh, logic board uh, that is dead. And the reason it's dead is if you take a look um, in an area on this board, I forget, oh yeah, right here, you can see that it's got a drill hole in it. Now, I don't know why someone would drill this board um, in this particular spot, uh, but this was uh, sent in to me uh, with this machine uh, by you know the person who owns it uh, to pull the CPU off of. And of course, that's exactly what I'm gonna do. So before I get started here, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna get this machine, the 17 inch to, uh, Core Duo MacBook Pro model here, uh, fully taken apart and get its logic board um, in the uh, dehydrator uh, to remove any potential moisture from it. Uh, these boards in particular are very prone to you know, retaining moisture inside of them in between their layers and any sort of heating or, or soldering on them uh, usually will cause them to popcorn if not properly prepared ahead of time. So I'm gonna get this machine taken apart. Um, this board I have already had in the dehydrator for about 24 hours now. Um, so this one's all good to heat. Um, but the one in the MacBook Pro, of course, I haven't taken out yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this MacBook taken apart, get the board in the dehydrator, and then after we do that, we need to begin the process of removing the original 2.33 gigahertz Core 2 Duo um, T7600, I believe. Yep, T7600, you can see right there. Um, we need to remove this CPU from this board and then prepare it uh, to be reballed uh, to solder onto this board. So let's get this MacBook Pro taken apart and we'll go from there. All right, so as you can see here, I've gotten the Core Duo MacBook Pro fully disassembled now, and I've got its logic board out up here, uh, laid out next to the donor 15-inch uh, late 2006 MacBook Pro logic board. And if you take a look at them, you can see uh, that they do look very similar. Now, of course, this one's a 15-inch, while this one's a 17-inch, uh, but they do have all the same chips, except, of course, the CPU. So if we go ahead and take a closer look at them together here, um, you can see uh, that the Core 2 Duo here, the T7600, as I mentioned, uh, is quite a bit larger. The die size is quite a bit larger uh, than the Core Duo here. And, uh, but other than that, uh, the other two chips are exactly the same. So it's got the same um, Intel 945 chipset here, and it's got the same ATI Radeon X1600 uh, video chipset there. So, 
All I need to do now, like I mentioned, is get the Core Duo board put in the dehydrator to get that prepared. And while that's in there, we can begin the process of desoldering and reballing this Core 2 Duo CPU. All right, so I've gotten the donor board up on the preheater here and gotten it all warmed up. Uh, so to begin the process of removing the chip, uh, the first thing we need to do is apply some flux. And with some fresh flux applied, we simply need to align the BGA hot air nozzle and begin heating. So in order to perform this removal, I am heating uh, the preheater up to about 180 degrees Celsius. And on the top heat with the nozzle there, uh, I am heating it to around 280 uh, up to about 290 degrees Celsius. And that should be enough to melt the lead free solder used on these boards. All right, so the chip is ready to come off. So I'm just gonna move the hot air out of the way and lift the chip off with some tweezers. And just like that, the chip has been successfully removed. So now we are ready to begin the process of reballing it. All right, so to begin the reballing process here, the first thing we need to do is of course, clean up all of the old solder off the chip here. And in order to do that, I'm gonna use uh, some leaded solder, um, some flux and some solder wick, of course, with my soldering iron. So to begin, uh, we'll first start by removing uh, the large pieces of solder, uh, just using some leaded solder. And with that taken care of, we can now remove the remainder of the solder using some solder wick. And now with all of the solder removed from the chip, we simply need to remove all this uh, burnt flux off of it using a bowl of rubbing alcohol. Just kind of stick that in there. Just rub it around in there, get all the flux off of it like so. And then once done, you just take it, put it on a paper towel and dry it off. And just like that, we've got what is now a completely clean chip ready for new solder to be applied. All right, and now with all the solder removed from the chip, uh, the next thing we need to do is just apply a small bit of flux to it. Heat it a little bit to spread that flux around. Then just spread the flux evenly across the chip using a paper towel. And now with a nice thin layer of flux applied to the chip, we need to take our BGA stencil right here, align it to the pads on the chip, and then place the chip into this little reballing jig here. And now you can see that all the pads align with the holes in the stencil. And with that all done, we're now ready to begin the process of reballing the chip. All right, so as you can see, I've gotten the stencil and the little jig here in a little container here, and that's just so uh, the solder balls don't, you know, go everywhere and make a huge mess on my desk here. Um, so with that, I've got a tube of 0.76 millimeter solder balls, which is the correct size uh, for this stencil. As you can see, it says right there. 
Um, so now we need to take them and just dump them across the chip. Uh, don't put too much, obviously, but uh, you want to try to get as many in the holes as possible, of course. Uh, but there are always going to be some that you have to go back and place in manually with a pair of tweezers. So let's just pour them on. And that looks pretty good there. So we're going to kind of take it and just kind of tap it around here and kind of get the balls to, you know, go over across the entire surface of the chip here. And hopefully we can get them in all the holes, but it's always a little bit difficult to do that. So that looks pretty good there. Um, so now we need to just remove all these balls from the center. So I'm just actually going to use my finger to kind of get them to stick to my finger and just put them in the container here. All right, so you can see I accidentally got a little bit out of the holes here. So we're just going to go and use the tweezers to place those into position. All right, so that looks really good there. Uh, as you can see, we've got a solder ball in every hole in the stencil and no excess solder balls, which of course is very important because you don't want those to cause you know, any bridging on these capacitors or anywhere else on the chip. Uh, so with that ready, uh, now we just need to get the hot air back up to temperature and begin heating. And for this, I'm using about 300 degrees Celsius on the hot air. Okay, and now with the initial heating done, uh, we then need to go around with some flux and apply it. And then we need to heat it one more time. Okay, and that looks really good there. Uh, so now we need to just let it cool down just a little bit and then we can remove it from the stencil. And now with the chip out of the stencil, uh, we need to make sure there's a good amount of flux on there. So add a little bit of extra if there are any pads that don't have enough flux on them. And that looks good there. And then we need to go around and heat the chip one last time. And with that final heating done, uh, we're done with the reballing. So that is the chip successfully and fully reballed. So with that, all we need to do is wait for the Core Duo logic board uh, to finish in the dehydrator, which should take about uh, two hours or so. And then we can get its CP removed and install this one. All right, so with moisture sufficiently removed from the board and our new chip reballed ready to be installed, now we can begin the process of desoldering the original Core Duo CPU. So just like with the donor board, uh, the first step is to apply flux. And now we just simply need to align the hot air and begin heating. Alright, as you can see there, the chip has been successfully removed, and the next thing we need to do is, of course, clean the residual solder off the pads. Now, when I do this, I'm actually going to do uh, something a bit unconventional, and that is I'm actually going to leave uh, a little bit of solder on each pad and basically just keep the pads tinned. And the reason I'm going to do that is if we take a look at our new CPU here, you can see it's got a bunch of capacitors in the middle. And the issue that that causes is the CPU uh, will not sit 
uh, fully flush with the board um, because the capacitors are actually ever so slightly taller or almost about the same size really as the solder balls here. And when you try to solder these on just empty pads, I found that because these are here, it can actually block or prevent some of the, uh, the solder balls here from actually making contact with their pads. And by adding solder to the pads ahead of time or leaving the pads tinned slightly, uh, we can uh, alleviate that issue. So I'm not gonna use solder wick in this instance, but I am going to simply remove all of these big clumps of solder that's obviously uh, bridging the pads here. All right, so with the pads having about an even amount of solder on each one, uh, now what I'm gonna do is just go around with a paper towel and some rubbing alcohol and clean off all this old flux. All right, and with all the pads feeling like they have an even amount of solder on them, uh, now we'll go ahead and apply a little bit of fresh flux. We'll use a dry paper towel just to uh, get a little bit of that off there because we don't need uh, a lot on here. You want a very small amount of flux on the board. And that looks about good. So now, of course, all we need to do is take our new chip and align it to the pads. Now having, this pre having these pads pretend like this uh, makes aligning the chip uh, quite a bit more difficult. Uh, but it is, as I mentioned, very necessary for this soldering process uh, to work effectively. So what I usually do is get it in its general position, and then you kind of have to mess around with it to kind of get it to go up onto the existing solder. Which can be very difficult. And there we go, I got it right there. You can kind of see it's a little bit raised. Uh, that's just because those uh, tinned pads are kind of pushing up on each of the solder balls. So now uh, we simply need to get the hot air aligned once again and heat it to solder it into position. All right, and just like that, the chip looks to be soldered on successfully. You could kind of see it drop there uh, right as I really began heating it almost. Uh, so let's go ahead and turn the hot air off, uh, turn off the board preheater, and let the board cool down. All right, so now that the board has cooled down sufficiently, we can go ahead and take a close look at it here. And you can see uh, that A, the CPU alignment looks exactly uh, perfect, exactly as we'd want. And if we take a look at it from the side here, you can see once again that all of those solder balls are perfectly uh, connected to their pads. You can see they all look identical. Uh, the chip is completely even uh, throughout the entire board. There's no edges that are raised or anything like that. And yeah, that is exactly what I want to see. So. Unless there's some firmware incompatibility that I'm not aware of, this board should now work with the Core 2 Duo CPU installed. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get this board uh, reinstalled back into the chassis and we'll give it a first power on test and see what happens. All right, so as you can see here, I've got the MacBook Pro partially reassembled now with the Core 2 Duo CPU installed, of course. So let's plug it in and see if it works.
And it does. And it's even booting. So that is awesome. That definitely means that my previous attempts at doing this that failed, uh, failed because of soldering issues and not an incompatibility with the board or system firmware. So that is really awesome to see. So let me go ahead and get the keyboard hooked up here. Um, I wonder if I can just do it while it's on. Let's see. Yep, works just fine. And let's go ahead and take a look at about this Mac. And yes, yes, look at that. It says Core 2 Duo there, but it is not detecting the clock speed properly, as you can see. Um, it only says it's a 1 gigahertz uh, Intel Core 2 Duo, when of course it is a 2.33 gigahertz uh, T7600. So let's go ahead and check out uh, System Profiler here. And you can see Model Identifier, MacBook Pro 1, 2, uh, Intel Core 2 Duo once again, which is an awesome sight to see. Um, but the only thing is that clock speed uh, is incorrect. So, one thing I want to try to do here, and uh, this is just purely for experimentation, but if it works, that would be a very good benefit of this to this machine, is I want to try to upgrade this to MacBook Pro 2, 1 firmware. Now, the 2,1 is the 17-inch version of the late 2006 model, which has a Core 2 Duo CPU, of course. And also by applying that firmware update or updating to 2,1 firmware, we gain the ability to use more than 2 gigabytes of memory in this system as well, uh, because the original Core Duo only supported up to 2 gigs, so there was a limit in the firmware to prevent you from installing more. Uh, but of course, with the Core 2 Duo, we can install up to 4 gigabytes. So I'm going to see if I can't get the system firmware updated, uh, but before, the, before I do that, I'm going to take this machine back apart, uh, dump its SPI ROM just in case it doesn't work and I have to recover um, and the system becomes bricked after doing so. Uh, but let me get that dumped, and then I'm going to attempt to install the 2,1 firmware update on this system. Alright, so I've gotten a firmware update copied onto here for the MacBook Pro 2,1, as you can see right there. And I've got a little script here uh, that will allow me to easily bless it uh, to boot uh, upon the next reboot here. So I really don't know if this is going to work. Uh, that's why I backed up the original SPI ROM ahead of time. Uh, but let's go ahead and give it a try and see what happens. Okay, everything seems to be correct there. Um, so now let's go ahead and shut the machine down. And then what we need to do is hold down the power button until the machine beeps and the little LED on the front flashes. Okay, the LED is flashing on the front there. And it beeped as expected. And as I figured, it did not accept that update. So I might have to figure out a different way to do this. All right, well, after messing with it for quite a bit, I could not manage to get the uh, firmware updater to work. Uh, so I went ahead and just took the easy route and desoldered the EEPROM again and updated it manually uh, just using a hex editor and the EEPROM programmer, of course. Um, so that's all done. Uh, I just copied in like all the personalized sections like the serial number um, and all that stuff. Um, so everything should work as expected. So let's go ahead and plug it in and see what happens. And there we go, it booted right up. So let's go ahead and let it boot into Mac OS. And there we go, we're now in Mac OS. So let's take a look at about this Mac. And look at that, it now detects the 2.33 gigahertz Core 2 Duo T7600 correctly as we would expect. So let's go ahead into more info here. And yep, there it is, MacBook Pro 2,1, Intel Core 2 Duo, fully detected as expected. And as I mentioned, now that uh, that firmware update has been applied, 
this machine now will support up to four gigabytes of system memory um, instead of just two gigabytes. So with that, that has been the successful upgrade of this 2006 Core Duo MacBook Pro 17-inch model to a 64-bit Core 2 Duo CPU, and in fact, the T7600, which is the best one that this platform supports. So, like I said, this is uh, quite an old machine at this point, but you know what they say, better late than never. Um, but yeah, that is the successful upgrade. So with that, I hope you enjoyed this video.